keep in mind that uh, while we want to consider and buy something that is very uh, interesting or pleasing to us, keep in mind the, the time and effort and the artistic ability and creativity that has gone into each and every piece of Indian arts and crafts, uh, regardless of uh, the tribal affiliation that it may come from. We're going to talk today a little bit about sampling and how the uh, styles and changes have been made in the last few years into a more contemporary field. To begin with, we're going to go to traditional. This uh, painting here is called Storm Figure and Lightning, and it's an alignment, alignment of nature. Uh, it has the sun in the center, four moons surrounding it. Uh, the four boxes on the outer extremity stand for the four times a year, white for spring, blue for summer, gold for fall, black for winter, and also the four times of day, uh, dawn, midday, dusk, dark, four sacred plants in between these. The bottom guardians are rainbow bars, uh, a sign of very powerful uh, elements that protect the Navajo nations, and each prayer or feather standing for a prayer and the chant that goes along with this. The upper corners, the opening of the painting, are guarded by medicine pouches. Most of you are probably familiar with this type of sand painting. It's very traditional to the Navajo, uh, and their philosophy started at the beginning of time and was brought with them through the ages, and uh, has done a lot in their curing ceremonies to cure for sickness, uh, bad luck, uh, weather conditions, putting nature back in balance, which this painting is done for. But one of the reasons we came today is to show you a change in the sand painting field that is a contemporary art, and it's called sand art. Uh, today with us we have Gerald Sherman. He's a Navajo artist from the Newcomb area of the reservation. 32 years old, has been sand painting since about 13. Uh, has done some traditional sand painting, but prefers to do mostly pictorials and uh, contemporary sand painting, subject matters that are traditional to him in, in not only his own Navajo lifestyle, but of the surrounding Indian tribes in areas around the Navajo nations. Uh, he does several in particular items that, that uh, he's kind of fond of. He likes bear fetishes. Uh, two gray hill rugs are his favorites, Akama pottery. Uh, Kachina dolls are also some of his favorites. In front of Gerald, you'll see several containers here. And these are containers of sand. And uh, most of the sand he prefers to go out and collect himself. Uh, the Navajo have almost a symbolic way of collecting sand. They believe when you take something from Mother Nature, you need to put something back. And so they prefer to collect the colors herself. Uh, the Navajos travel as much as a 500 mile range in order to get these colors of sand and they range from Criscola, which is a blue that comes from the globe from the copper mines, uh, magnetite, gypsum, which is white, uh, and several other sandstone colors that run from red, gold, um, various shades of orange and so forth through there. A lot of colors or some colors are mixed in contemporary sand painting. In traditional sand paintings, there's five basic colors, gold, red, black, white and blue. But for contemporary sand paintings, you see a much more wider variety of sands. In fact, a lot of times the degree a sand artist can carry his own field is by where these sands are. Not every sand that you find will work. It has to be uh, ground up and it has to granulate when it grinds so that it doesn't float into the glue or crack when it dries. So it takes these, a small corn grinder in order to grind these sands and then it's sifted through a mesh material, much like a uh, scarf, in order to get the same texture in a sand. Some artists use the same texture on all sands, some like a variation of, of uh, textures in these sands. Uh, Gerald likes a variation of, of sand textures and, and as many colors as possibly he can find. We're looking at about one half of his sand color scheme that he likes to work with. And uh, so you can imagine some of the areas and range that he has to go in order to get all these colors. Right now he started off, he already has the background on the board that he's painting on. It's on a piece of just particle board. And he's already applied a background color uh, three coats of that. And he sifts the sand colors onto the board and then waits for them to dry, brushes the loose sand off and puts another coat in order to get a buildup. After that, they use a sharp point in order to scratch an outline of the figure they're going to draw to give them some kind of guideline as to what they're going to paint. Today he's doing an eagle dancer for us and he's almost got it sketched. Then one layer at a time, he'll put sand on this, bringing up layers. In sand art, the layers of sand are somewhat worked wet in order to give different shading and highlights of tones in them. In traditional sand painting, each color is dried between each layer of sand. So it can take quite a bit of time in order to do a sand painting. So we'll skip from one to another here, kind of give you an idea of, of uh, 
how many colors and, and different process of putting this sand on. We've moved ahead just a little bit. Gerald is now applying glue to the sand painting in order to start putting the layers on the sand on the board. Now what he's doing is filling in the areas that he wants the sand to stick just with the glue mixture. And this glue mixture is, is partially Elmer's glue and water mixture. Uh, each artist likes a different mixture of glue and water in order to get a drying time that he feels comfortable with. And he's applying the sand, sand and as you'll notice, he picks it up. The sand will only stick in the areas where the glue has been applied. Now, traditional sand painting is done much in this fashion right here, where you're separating every color of sand in between. And uh, just a minute here, we're going to go off. He's going to apply sand over sand in order to show shading and highlight. Uh, it's critical that this glue mixture be just right as you do this. Uh, too much water in it will make the, uh, the sand bubble up and crack as it dries. Uh, smoothness, evenness of texture are very much a, a part of sand painting in order to get a, a really fine picture of, of the quality that we're after. Uh, Gerald has entered a lot of competitions, have won a lot of awards doing this type of sand painting, which is sand art. It started in the area of about 15 to 20 years ago in sand art. And up until then, most sand was was done on a hogan floor. It was destroyed after it was done, having daytime and nighttime ceremonies. Uh, daytime were destroyed before dark, nighttime stored before daylight. Uh, then the field of contemporary art came in. A lot of it started because artists were nervous about doing traditional designs on a permanent basis. And so they switched subject matters to show their art and their expertise with working with this media and yet not offending their own culture. Uh, I think to some extent that's why they've chosen subjects not particularly Navajo, but of all the Indians, the Southwestern Indians that they prefer to work with. They can be from simple still lifes to abstract. Uh, a lot of scenery has come out uh, to show different variations of how the artists like to work in a, in a different medium. Um, in just a second here, we're going to skip to a pottery piece that he's already done. And he's going to do some detail work with you to show a more finer part of how this is done. The big pieces don't take the amount of control that, that the finer detail work takes. We've changed sand painting in order to show you a little more variety of what sand art can be. And, and this field is called sand art rather than traditional sand painting or figure painting. The painting that he has in front of him now is, is a pottery piece. And as you note, it's got several different tones to it. The dark side to the back of the painting has been shaded with a darker brown in order to give it a little more dimension than the shadow side. The piece closest to the front of the table has been put with a highlight showing the light spot on it. This is done in order to show layering of uh, the sand paintings to show the different, to give the painting a little more formation, to show a little depth on it. Uh, sand painting, sand art traditionally is done one color at a time with separation between each color, so it shows no dimension. By doing it this way, they can uh, show some depth to the pot, giving it more of, a, of an oil painting or acrylic painting aspect. Uh, sand art is, is kind of unique in that, unlike oil painting, when you need a different color to give shading or highlight, that color is almost impossible to mix. You have to find sands relatively close to the color you're work, looking to finish out with. Uh, a little mixing will change the color somewhat, but not to a great degree. So in order to get depth and perception of field, um, a wide variety of colors that, that are close enough in design are very important. Uh, these colors are mostly taught between close friends and family members. It's very seldom that, that uh, an outsider would tell a sand painter where these sands are found. So it's, it's uh, important that a family usually has a background from sand painting. Gerald is, is strictly self-taught. No one in his family uh, sand painted before him. So he's, he's had to learn this from a young age. And, He's done this by working almost as an apprentice with some other sand painters. Harry Yebin, it was one of the men that he worked with for a long time in order to, to get his start on the technique, uh, although his teacher was a traditional sand painter. Uh, Gerald feels a lot more comfortable working with, with more of the sand art. He also does a little acrylic and uh, oil painting in order to kind of tune his, his sand painting. An unusual thing about sand art is that unlike oils and acrylics, you can't change your painting so much after you started. The shading highlighting and, and dimension work has to be done from the first stage up. So you've got to know pretty well how the painting is going to finish before you start. Another thing is, even though you know where you're going to end up, 
with the sand, there's no erasing. So if the painting changes on you, you kind of have to flow with it, uh, which means that uh, an original is really an understatement for sand art because it's very hard to copy another piece even if you were on purpose trying to do so. As Gerald goes on here, you'll see him detailing the pot. And as with most Navajo art forms, measuring is kind of a built-in sense with the Navajos. They seem to have a depth and proportioning sense built into them in order to mark a pot off and keep even dimension without having to measure and, uh, and calculate these things. The designs that are coming on the pot are mostly out of his head from research he's done on auto pottery or just pieces he's admired through his life. Uh, the piece here, I think, now is, is headed more towards an Acoma piece. And uh, he uses details that are really important to the, to the tribe that's affiliated with the pot. And even though this is not Navajo subject matter, uh, the, the technique of sampling is very much Navajo. Uh, for just a minute, we're going to scan up on the wall here in order to show you some variations of, of what Gerald's art form is as he finishes on this pot. If you'll notice here, he's using pieces more from the Pueblo Indians in here. Uh, again, he always likes to use a lot of pottery and, and, and this type of thing. Uh, just off to the side here, you'll see a Pueblo more of a Mesa Verde scene with a broken pot, mostly from the Anastasi, the old Hopi uh, type of pottery from northern New Mexico and Arizona, which is a favorite subject of his because he lives in this area. Uh, panning off farther to the side from it, you'll see some abstracts. And these are very contemporary in subject matter. Uh, the pot the main subject matter, although is, is very traditional, the symbolisms around it are, are very depicting of, of several different Indian tribes, mazes and, and uh, stair steps, Pueblo designs, symbolic designs, but done very contemporary in subject. Colors, even though uh, sand painting is, is done very traditionally, in the last few years we've seen some addition to some dyed colors, especially in blue, and they're done mostly to stabilize the blue. blue like turquoise will turn green after a few years. So it's, it's being stabilized a little more in order to give them a little more color to work with. Uh, on across, you'll see a piece that is raised. The war shield and the pottery on that piece has been carved out of wood and, and added on to the, to the original board in order to give depth and uh, a little different, more contemporary feeling of the artist. And on father, a still life painting with a peyote prayer, prayer, prayer fan and a two gray hill rug and some pottery pieces there. So sand painting can take on a multitude of uh, subject matter, even though they prefer to stay very symbolic of the Southwest and the Indian tribes surrounding the Navajo tribe. If we'll pan back now to the paintings Gerald's working on, he'll do a little more detail work. And you'll see how this layering process is, is starting to play in, in the role of finishing this painting. And sand painting is not a very fast field. It takes uh, quite a bit of time in order to work all these colors, mainly due to the drying time and uh, the way the sand is put on there. Uh, we hope that maybe this thing has given you some idea about sand painting, uh, especially sand art, which is the field we're working with today. And uh, you should look for it when you're out shopping. Mostly done by Navajo Indians. It, the sand painting art is traditional to their uh, culture, although not many of the other Southwest tribes have gotten into it, even in a sand art field. The traditional painting is uh, strictly a Navajo ceremonial and is only done by the Navajos. Hi, my name is John Edwards. Uh, I'm from Colorado. Uh, I represent some of today's very top Southwest Indian gold and silversmiths. I'm here today with Vernon Begay. Vernon is one of today's top uh, silver and gold smiths. He's relatively young in the craftsmanship and I'm here to, I'm going to ask him a few questions to give you a little background on Vernon and, and how he's been taught through the years as far as the silversmithing trade. Vernon, how old are you, first of all? I'm 23 years old. Uh, how long have you been doing silversmithing? Since when I was 12. Uh, did you, where did you learn the craft from? I grew up in a family of um, silversmiths, so uh, I learned it from my parents. What other training have you had in the silversmithing? When I was in high school, I took some courses in jewelry making. Very good. What do you think is happening in today's uh, Indian market as far as which direction do you think the jewelry is going? I feel like the jewelry is going more in the direction of modern type of um, jewelry. Is that what you prefer to do? Yes. 
Um, where are some of the ideas that you get for your jewelry coming from? Some of the designs that I like to use is the rug design. I've always um, liked the rug design because it's um, part of the Navajo um, tradition. What type of materials are you been using now? I've used all different types of stone. Lapis, coral, sujolite. Well, do you find it uh, quite a bit different nowadays to work with these various stones as far as more of a challenge to you? Yes, it is, because um, all of these uh, different type of stones have um, their different hardness, so you have to um, know how to polish them and, and grind them, and you just have to know how to fix them. How about the difference between using uh, sterling silver versus gold? Okay, um, I just started recently started working with gold, and um, the soldering process is on it is, I mean, slow. And um, gold mounts easy, that's what I found out. So you can have a lot of, uh, a fairly expensive mistake fairly fast with the gold over the silver. Yes, you're right. <laughs> okay. um, we're here today with the Southwest Trading Company in St. Charles, Illinois, which is one of the finest galleries in the country today. Uh, Vernon's work is really being presented all over the country in some very nice uh, museums and galleries. Uh, Vernon is, just like he said, been working with gold now here for about three or four months and really for his age and the quality of his craftsmanship at this time, in a few more years he will be probably classified as the best Navajo silversmith alive. Uh, I think Vernon realizes his potential and, and he seems to be an extremely hard-working individual and he's cr extremely creative. Oh, he misplaces it. Really. weekend to have Jennifer Medina and Al Joe joining us to do both show their jewelry as well as lecture and share their knowledge which is both personal knowledge and professional knowledge of turquoise and um, some of the things that you can learn to look for in purchasing your own beautiful pieces of turquoise. Jennifer Medina comes to us from the Santa Domingo Pueblo which is located between Albuquerque and Santa Fe in New Mexico. She will go into some uh, explanation about her people and what turquoise means to them. She's a jeweler herself. Her family, she comes from the family of jewelers, and she also has 